New Mexico is a tapestry of color, sound, art, food, and culture, but what it's known for most is the Native American art scene. Santa Fe's Indian Market is the largest and oldest Native American art show in the world. It was originally established in 1922, a place for natives across Indian country to show and sell their work. Every August, the historic plaza and surrounding streets of Santa Fe, New Mexico, become the setting for this event, attracting over 100,000 visitors to Santa Fe from all over the world. Indian Market is filled with an exciting and contagious energy where art, culture, and the history of the original people of the Americas is seen through the creators. As a native indigenous art dealer, I'm turning my sights towards capturing what's happening in the native art scene. And what better place than Santa Fe's Indian Market? 2021 is especially important since COVID shut down last year's market. For many native artists, it was a huge blow because Indian Market brings in $100 million in revenue. And for some, it represents almost a year's worth of income. My first stop is Comanche artist Nakona Burgess. Nakona has made a name for himself taking old photographs and transforming them with his modern colorful compositions. So you're capturing people from your history and kind of bringing them to life, but these are actually real people? Yeah, they're real people, so they have stories behind them. I try to do as much research as I can on the subjects. Okay. Sometimes there's not a lot of information on them, you know, and I just paint the painting because they're beautiful. But it's just kind of breathing life back into their story, right. you know, because I always say at the time that these photographs were taken, for the most part, the old ones, we were less than human. There's artists showing from every part right. of, you know, the nation, right. which is really exciting to see how different the culture is. Right. When it's Indian market, it's all over the native that. country, you know, so yeah. You know, 100,000 people or sometimes 150,000 people love our Indian art so much, they're crazy about it. They come, mm -hmm. you know, and they spend $150 million here. From all over the world, right. right? And so, yeah, so I just remember that, that, you know, these people love it. They use their leave, they use their money, they buy hotels, they eat, they support, they walk around, you know, and they, it, it's what really made Santa Fe. So my last question is, is have you been working for a really long time for this particular Indian market, knowing it would be like a year and now it's open back? Yeah, well, kind of last year when everything kind of shut down and Swaya let us know that Indian market wasn't happening. You know, we were all kind of bummed and like, yeah. you know, well, now what? But, and my son, who kind of joked, he goes, well, just think, Dad, next year you'll have 100 paintings. And I, without thinking about it, the other day, I was finishing up a few pieces and varnishing them, and I was going through my inventory here and going for the inventory of my booth. And what do you know? I've got 102 paintings, you know. That's your so next manager. It. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah so <laughs> How old is he now? He's 12. Yeah, so, yeah. and very talented yeah, as well. Yeah. I think the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. Well, people always say, he's going to be better and more famous than you. And I'm like, well, that's the point. You're like, you know? good. He can support yeah, me. Yeah, he's then. my retirement plan. <laughs> The galleries in the plaza are packed with collectors, and the energy is high. I 
popped in next door to meet with one of my longtime favorite contemporary jewelry artists, Ray Tracy, whose art has been exhibited in museums and shows internationally. What tribe are you from, first of all? I'm Navajo. Okay. Yeah, I live on the Navajo Reservation. I grew up in Ganado, Arizona. I've been doing jewelry since I was like 10 years old. Wow. Uh, and I still love it. It's, uh, when, when I was living in L.A., I was an aspiring actor. And he, okay. The only reason I was an actor is because I looked like an Indian. I had no talent. You know? <laughs> but, well, you uh, are a good-looking man, so well, that, that's some talent. Right? Well, okay. that's beside the point. The point is, I looked like an Indian. Back then, I was real skinny, too. I looked like a starving Indian. I could get on a horse and take my shirt off and not be embarrassed. But now, there's no way I'd do something like that. <laughs> so what do you, how did Indian market shape your career? When, when I was doing Indian market, it was just that square, you know, mm -hmm. around around the plaza. Right. And now they've got it on Lincoln, Washington, down San Francisco, and, and then down here uh, on Palace. So just the number of people that are starting to participate is astronomical. And the talent pool has really gotten good. So if you can get into, just into Indian market, right. it's a feather in your cap. Because then, wow, you got he got into Indian market. So right. he must... <laughs> He must be have some credibility and he must have some talent. I'm doing a line of new feathers and that's what I'm working on now is a new line of feather work and I've, I've, uh, I've released it in, in the Japanese market. We have a gallery over there, Ray Tracy Tokyo, and so we've released it in Japan and it's, it's doing very well. That was really the focus of designing this new line is for the Japanese market and we're doing it here and it's selling so it's good. I ran into another indigenous talent, Gary Cook, a world-class musician who's worked with artists across multiple genres, including Sting and Joni Mitchell. Gary took a minute to talk with me in between jamming with his local band. To your music, and I'm not going to take you away too long. Yeah, I, get back I know play. I can see them going. Where did he yeah, go? Did he go? Um, have you utilized music in storytelling about your heritage? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Uh, one of my films is called Tomena, which means father in uh, in Tiwa, and that's filled with music. Santa Fe's art scene is attracting young native talent, and tonight was the grand opening for RLB Gallery. There's a DJ spinning and native clothing design in one area, art in another. I don't think these guys know what they're getting themselves into, but it's great to see the entrepreneurial spirit alive and well. We decided to, you know, go big and um, sign a three-year lease, you know? That's a commitment. It is a commitment. I know being from the art world and having galleries, boy, once you sign your name on the dotted yep. line, yep. the hustle has to be strong. So tell me a little bit about your creativity. I know, I mean, I love your design, but is it mostly fashion or are you getting into art? What else are you doing? So I'm schooled with graphic design first, okay. you know, um, but I could always paint. I was, you know, I came up doing a, by the way of graffiti. Okay. So I have that like um, just very like raw style, you know. You know, I'll take like shoe polish and mix ink with it, you know, spray paint, paint markers, you know. I use That's a lot of very um, res. Yeah, it's very <laughs> res. I have a lot, you know what I mean? I use glue, I'll use like tar, uh, roofing tar also, so everything's, you know, original. You have to see it, you have to have mentors, you know. And if I'd never seen anyone being able to make a living off of art, you know, I probably would have went into it. So big shout out to all my mentors out there. I and I have people, you know, my little protégés that I look after also. I love you know? it. So last question, what do you so, think's gonna happen Santa Fe Indian Market 2021? 2021 is amazing, there's so much, it's amazing because there's a, a style change. Yeah. There's a whole lot of, you know, the younger, which we've been waiting for for the last 20 years, is now creeping on the come up and it's sprouting. You know, yes. it started, but now you're seeing a whole lot of it. You know, a lot of people are opening up their pop-up shops. You know, you have Sovereign, you have the people so at Buffalo great. Thunder, you know, rail yards, and I'm sure there's many more openings here. You know, very exciting time to do art. 
As the evening ended, we went to a pop-up with the bad boy of native jewelry, Cody Sanderson. So what was the very first Indian market you did? What oh, year? Man. Uh oh, dating you. <laughs> Well, Sevillas Road was a dirt road, and there was Burroughs, and Burrow Alley had nothing but donkeys. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> they had, uh, shoot, it was back in the early 2006, maybe, 2008, okay. and been here ever since. You're probably an anomaly because most of the artists that I've talked to here, this is like their big thing, right? This right. is where they make all of their revenue, they work all year long, and this is where it happens. But I was doing um, different shows in different places in the world. We were doing um, Tokyo Fashion Week, we did New York, and we did Paris. And we found that Paris was probably the best one for us because we just like one stop and the rest of the world comes to you even though you're going to Paris. It was the best for me just to go there and meet everybody. So this year it's representing more because you can't do all of that. Correct. Got Limited it. traveling. Okay. I've tried to get out of the country a couple times this year and I was stopped at the airport in Dallas and another time in San Francisco. Wow. That's got to be tough. All my work was completed and all the paperwork I had all out. And mm -hmm. I mean the quarantine hotel, the shots and I had everything but then they threw that and he said where's your invitation from the embassy and I like yes. nobody told me oh, so that's devastating well here we are you know 2021 is there a certain iconic piece that everybody keeps going to like your go-to everybody wants it everybody loves it some of my star rings cost-wise my premier piece would probably be this 18 karat gold uh, diamond it's um, that. it's a headdress, uh, mimicking, emulating a headdress, and it can be worn. Like yeah, a little tiara. tiara. Mm -hmm. I love that. So, just fast forward. Mm -hmm. What are you hoping for this next year to bring? You know, even though I feel like I have a lot of people that know my work already, there's still a few billion left. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's great. Saturday morning comes quickly. We get up with the sun to meet native culinary artist Lois Ellen Frank at Santa Fe's Farmer's Market. Lois, owner of Red Mesa Cuisine, has a heart for teaching people about food sustainability and the importance of indigenous plants that have kept the tribes healthy and still in existence. So how often do you come? Like, do you come every week and every week, choose everything? Uh, there's also a Tuesday, but it's not as uh, big. Okay. Today I'll just get some potatoes. Uh, and these are my favorite because they're very creamy, but we have the uh, purple blue or the indigenous blue okay. uh, fingerlings. And of course, all potatoes given to the world by native people. Right. So it's an indigenous crop, very important. I think one of the the most special foods uh, is the flowers of the squash, but you know there's eight ingredients that native people gave to the world. This magic eight are eight, eight, so corn, beans, squash, chili, tomato, potato, vanilla, and cacao. All of these indigenous American foods were given to the rest of the world, and a lot of people don't know that history. So was this one of the magic eight? This is one of the magic eight. Here you uh, have it. It's got a very thick skin that's not very good unless you get it roasted and peel it off. So that's what we do. Okay, let's see. You guys so we ready? have a fresh roasted chili. It's gonna be warm and she's starting on the end that's not as hot. As you get up to the the, the stem, it's gonna be hotter. That's where the seeds are. Wow. So you uh, this but is amazing. delicious. It's delicious. So there's nothing like it. I want to say our next stop is going to have to be her kitchen, but we have to go to Indian Market. Indian Market. <laughs> now it's off to Indian Market. It's an incredible scene with so much talent in one place, it's hard to know who to interview. The smell of fry bread and native eagle dancers stop us at the plaza stage. 
I make my way through the crowd to woodcarver LX Lewis from the Lakota tribe. I personally collect LX work and I'd love to see what's new. When people talk about Indian country and even like from, you've been to where I'm from, yeah. from Rincon, this is like the Super Bowl of the arts in Indian country. And so you are one of, if not the premier wood carver because there are hardly any wood carvers here. I mean, I've been walking around. Yeah. So tell us about this piece, how you actually approach it. What's the wood that you're using? And this is a, a, a hardwood, it's a dense wood. So when I, I, people always ask me that, um, is, this a, is this a hardwood? And I said, if it was easy, everybody would be carving it. <laughs> but that was my kind of inside joke. I don't know if anybody gets it. But yeah, when I, I just realized too, like, man, I, there's a 4D, instead of a 3D aspect, there's a 4D from when I'm carving, um, just be the message, you know, be the message. You have a 3D object, but you also have that that fourth, which is the message of what it what it brings to you. It's, you know, everybody has a different connection with what they see. So I, I just have that as a 4D. That, that's my new thing now. And what's the but name of this one? This one is, uh, I have the title right here. Sorry, I didn't have no, I couldn't afford no spindles. Um, the name is the Bethlehemini. This part of uh, um, the black sheep is uh, translated as black sheep. So this wood is uh it's, it's dark naturally right and it's it's just so so many different colors so the darker part and this ended up becoming like a dark sheep or these are lambs and there's a little lamb up here so yeah did you guys see the little lamb look at that yeah. so detailed coming out yeah i look for something that's already gray and already ran its life through this life you know, it's laying on the ground. It has no life in it, in a sense. Um, gray, and you think it's just firewood. I look for those pieces, and those are okay. the ones that have the most color. And believe it or not, this was gray. So you actually sand, you know, dig into it, and the colors come back to life. So I, I bring incredible. it. I bring it back into a, a different life. So this is a different form of it. So we, it's part of our own tradition and own culture too, because we have another life. In a sense, we have a life here, but we also have this other different life that's not what we see. So it's the same thought process that I always do. I always kind of give it a, a second life. Generations before Europeans landed on the shores of the New World, native beadwork was being made. Jackie Bread of the Blackfeet Nation has taken this art form to the next level. The winner of numerous blue ribbons at Indian Market, Jackie's booth is almost sold out before I can get there. I'm from the Blackfeet Nation, Browning, okay. Montana. We border Glacier National Park. Okay. And so you learned this tradition from your family. Who, yeah. who was the beater? Yes, my grandmother was, and um, she had passed away before I was born, but we had a legacy of her beadwork, okay. and I fell in love with it. And uh, I really wanted to know more, and my dad remembered a little bit because he had helped her and everything, so he kind of got me started. Okay. And I just went from there, and it's just all um, practice, practice, practice. Walk us through, like when you first started, you weren't creating this. No. <laughs> <laughs> I was just learning the basic stitches. Okay. And we are well known for our two needle stitch, where that carries, one needle carries the beads, needle and thread carries the beads, and the other one sews them down. And it's also known as flat stitch, so it gives you this very flat imagery. Who are these people? Some of them are relatives. This okay. one is relative. His, okay, his name one. is Thundercloud. This one Jim Knight Rider. And by the way, folks, we're seeing we came a little bit later, so we didn't interrupt her and, and what she's here for, which is to share her beautiful work in commerce. But we, we you're pretty much wiped out. Yes, that's a good thing. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So tell me who is this? His name is Jim Knight Rider. Uh, his name is also Thundercloud. Okay. And just really beautiful vintage photos. Uh, my mom and dad would have been about 95 this year. So they experienced um, our older generation and they knew lots of stories. So I think about those stories when I bead um, 
just like really beautiful, candid stories they told me. And it's very personal. It becomes a very personal experience. And when you're beating, do you ever feel like you're feel, feeling the spirit of the ancestors because this is what the traditions were of Abs your tribe? Absolutely, absolutely. This is what we were known for, is for our beadwork, our high quality beadwork. And I love that I'm carrying that tradition. And to an extent, my children do. And so it's passing down yes. now the generations from your grandmother yes. to your, your hands. And I think you're just, look at this, just taking it to the absolute next level. I mean, this is just, oh, so gorgeous. Thank you. And how long does it take you to do something like this? Beadwork is one of those kind of things, if you're not wanting to spend a lot of time, you don't want to do it. It's basically for the love of doing it because it is so time consuming. So do you have any idea how much time you oh, put into this? No, because I'm chasing my granddaughter around also <laughs> while I'm doing it. So. That makes sense. Okay, fair enough. Well, thank you so much for sharing you. your beautiful talent and also the tradition of your tribe. Next stop is Bronze Sculpture by Teresa White, a newbie to Santa Fe Indian Market. Like many Native artists, she's reconnecting with her culture through stories that have been passed down from her grandma and aunties. These look like something that, um, you know, somebody who started when they were a child, and so I would Thank imagine you. this must have just come to you. It, it did just come to me, I and mean, sometimes I just, I don't really understand it. I sometimes don't even know when I'm sculpting until it's done. That's not how it always goes, but right? sometimes I'm just moving the clay. But I, I feel like I'm drawing closer to my ancestors through this process. Coming, living in the city, being um, moved away from my family's homeland, um, I've had a lot of challenges connecting and my culture bearers have passed now, mm -hmm. my aunties and my granny, and so I use this as a way to um, find them, you know, mm. every day. It's a practice. So beautiful, and I can relate because I lived off and mm. on the reservation, so mm. you do feel like you've lost your culture, yeah. and art is something that we can um, express you know, indigenous culture, but yeah. also when we look at it, it reminds us of who we are. It does, so every that's what... day it reminds me. Yep, it draws me closer to um, Native community as well. It opens so many doors to um, connection. That's so tell me about, about let's choose this piece. Mm. Tell me about this and the symbolic meaning and how you, you know, just, I guess how you approach yeah. it when you're gonna create. Well, this piece is um, brand new. It's just been done for a week. Oh. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, it's my most recent piece. And it actually, the the this gesture uh, came from a story that one of my great aunties told me about the village, um, when they were in the village, and uh, a baby ran through the um, legs of Mrs. Vanderpool. And my auntie said, oh, you're gonna be, you have you have a baby on the way. Oh. And Mrs. Vanderpool's like, no, but she did. But this piece is really about, um, so that was sort of the inspiration for the gesture. But this is pe this piece is about interconnection and um, how, it's called Antidote. And okay. it's about how um, connection, interconnection, is an antidote to environmental destruction essentially because right. when we remember who we are that we're part of the earth that our decisions matter that um, every move we make is part of something else um, other people other animal people part of the land then um, then that's how we change the world from ancient times to the present Native Americans have created baskets this artwork often involves secret techniques that are passed down from generation to generation. Navajo weaver Sally Black is one of the most recognizable names in basket making. What is the story? What are we looking at here? Okay, this is represent of the fire that's going and these people are, they got together and then they start dancing. And that's kind of like a healing dance that we do when people, somebody's sick. Okay. And then we dance, we have a squad dance. And like the first night, the second night, and then the third night, we usually, people dance like this. It's beautiful. And, so, and do you still do that now? Yeah, that's our traditional thing that we have. And is it a certain time of year or? In the summer. Okay. Yeah. Oh, look summer. at that. Just incredible. Such a beautiful talent. Mm -hmm. So you are really preserving too your culture, uh -huh. you know, because it's not just beautiful basket making, but it's also uh -huh. storytelling. 
Yeah. And I love that. Um, How long does it take for something like this? Um, that one took like almost a month, over a month. Okay. But it's also taken you your whole life to get this good, yeah. right? Yeah. So I always tell people, yeah. when you ask an artist, how long does it take? You have to ask them how long they've been doing it. Uh -huh. Because that's, you don't get to this, one that's the number know. one, right? But yeah. the truth of the matter is, is that it's taken you probably from the time you were a child uh -huh. to be able to create something this beautiful. Yeah. So it's wonderful. Yeah, I learned it when I was eight years old. Okay. Just watching my mom and... I kind of, I really wanted to do this, and when I was about 12, I picture myself being way up here. Well, your dream came true, and you have impacted the world with your art, so thank you so much, uh -huh. and welcome. I hope to see you again next year. Okay, I'll see you guys again. One thing most people don't know about Native Americans is that we love our fashion. Natives have been adorning themselves for 14,000 years, and our swagger differs from tribe to tribe. My next stop is with fashion designer Patricia Michaels, who shined a spotlight on Native design when she appeared on Project Runway. You really put Natives on the map when it came to fashion. Thank you. I mean, you really, you were the forerunner. Thank you. And now we see all these designers yes. coming up. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, everybody points to you. How do you feel about that, girl? Oh, it's like a, <laughs> it's an absolute blessing because it was a battle to have just one voice out there. Mm -hmm. And I was an advocate to say we need more designers because there's too many uh, stories and designs and techniques to be shown to the world yes. to understand the vast beauty that plays into Native American country. Right. And once people start to see the brilliance with the, with the body moving in the design of textiles and the uniqueness of who we are, then our voice will then be projected into a higher level. All of these um, textures and designs represents a region. Okay. And that's really important because people don't know that we exist throughout the United States. Right. So um, when they come to beautiful Swaya for all the artists and to see the work, then they can get a taste of what Native American country is about. When you very first started, was it hard to get, you know, to get out there and to be accepted in the fashion community? Oh yes, when, when I was 18, the first time I went to Manhattan, and I, I explored and wanted to know what the industry was about. Manhattan was still where Times Square had the, the pimps and the hoes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to date her because we're about the same age here. What year was that? 85. Yeah, okay. I got you, sister. Right. And fashion, I think, in that time was a real white. I yes. mean, and, you know, yes. it was a real white industry. Yeah, and I don't even remember, I don't know if you remember, I mean, we never saw a Native woman on the cover of a magazine. Never. Ever. Ever since then, I would go back, and mm -hmm. it's changed, it's evolved. And then after doing Project Runway, that opened up the floodgates. Nobody questioned who I was or what so I was doing. Great. It was just a matter of, yes, let's celebrate Native voice and vision. I just love coming to Indian Market. And how many years have you been here? So I'm 55 now. Okay. And I've been coming since I was in my mother's stomach. Oh my gosh. She was um, the first Native American gallery owner downtown Santa Fe. Okay. Danced at the. She was. I was in her stomach when she danced at the opening of her gallery. Okay. And the next day she gave birth to me, put me in the room with all the Navajo rugs, <laughs> the corn husk bags, beadwork. In board, Pueblo embroidery work. And I think that's when all the spirits went in and said, Oh, Patricia Michaels, you're the baby. Yep. And then, <laughs> so you got infused there, and girl, look what you're bringing to the world. Right. We came, we saw, and Indian Market 2021 delivered. It's our art, our music, our culture, which has been the backbone of our society. Our cultural heritage is who we are, and Indian Market is a perfect example of why we are still here. It's a joy and a privilege to show the many layers of the first indigenous people on this continent. I am Ruth Ann Thorne, and this is Indian Country.